I was just uh, saying to Richard that some of the feedback I've heard is that he's sound, powerful. Okay, that still allows you to ask hard questions. So those of you who've had a chance over the coffee or the tea or the chat, take the opportunity to ask a question, to make a comment, to offer a, a reflection. And don't worry as people come back. We're not rushing anybody. Anybody who would like to make a comment or ask a question so far? Thank you. Thank you very much for a, for a wonderful presentation and uh, also for what you have uh, written in your books as well. And I'm a Celtic Studies graduate and um, I thought I would just share this with you. Uh, I was also uh, trained in Maynooth during the Second Vatican Council. And what I have found is that the insights of the Second Vatican Council are wonderfully reflected in the early Irish church. You know, the whole ecclesiology of the early Irish church, uh, the early monasteries, and particularly a field that I'm very interested in myself, in the visual expression, uh, you know the great high crosses of Ireland, sometimes called the Celtic crosses, with the spirituality that is in the sculpture on the great crosses is very much expressive of this kind of ecclesiology that came, came not came, but came back with the Second Vatican Council. I know there was a, a conscious uh, research of the early church, the early original church, but it is very interesting that it's reflected in the early Irish church in a particular way. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm very much just learning about that. I had a chance to visit Clonmac Noise, which was very, yes, very inspirational for me, very inspirational to just to go back and imagine, my gosh, here's this Christian community in the early 6th century. I, really, it was quite moving. In the United States, we think sir, things are ancient if they go back two decades. You know, you, you have a different sense of things here. But really, it was very inspirational, and I, I have no doubt that there's a great deal to learn there. Your vision of Vatican II agrees with my vision of Vatican II. But right. why? Why has it not been implemented? Why has the church tried to go away in a different direction? That's good. Thank you for asking that. I think the answer should be clear to the both of us that not enough people have bought my books. No. <laughs> no. You know, I think it's a very good question with lots of answers. You know, like most things like that, there's the, you can't point to one thing. Uh, I'm sorry, the question really was why have we, why have we not implemented, why are not more people hearing about this vision and why hasn't it been implemented more? Is, it, I take that to be the, the substance of it. How come, and I heard this when, when I was in Athlone, some people said, you know, I'm well raised, I've, I've been educated in the Catholic Church, I've gone to schools, I've gone to mass, why is it I've not heard this? And I think, I think it's a good question. The answer's complicated, but let me take a shot at it. One of the problems has to do with the, with the very enormity of what Vatican II accomplished. There are, Vatican II was the 21st ecumenical council in the church, okay? So the first ecumenical council was the Council of Nicaea, from which we get the Nicene Creed. And that, of course, goes back to the early fourth century. Now, if you took the decrees of all 21 councils, from the Council of Nicaea to Vatican II, you took all the texts that they published, you counted all the lines, the total of all 21 councils would be about 37,000 lines of text, okay? If you just took Vatican II, it's a third of that. So in other words, Vatican II produced this huge body of literature. It's a big book if you've ever seen it. I mean, this is not something you just browse through, you know, in an afternoon. And so because they published so many documents that, that said so much, 
I think it became hard for people to to pull it all together. It becomes overwhelming after a while. You know, it's like telling somebody who's a new Christian, oh, well, let's learn about Jesus here. Take your Bible and just start at Genesis 1-1 and keep going till the end. You're not going to make it. So, so part of the problem was because studying the council took a lot of work and because it's not the kind of thing you can do on your own any more than you really can read the Bible without a good commentary, what happened for a lot of our clergy and, and religious was it was easier to just pick some simple ideas and slogans and things and not take the whole vision seriously. So that's part of the problem. The second part of the problem is a little more controversial, and I'm reluctant to put this out there. Um, but as I said in Athlone, in Texas we have a saying, speak the truth and ride a fast horse. All right? And I'm riding a fast horse out of here tomorrow morning. So I'm going to speak the truth. One of the big dynamics at Vatican II was that there were not all, but many of the bishops who worked full-time in the Roman Curia, does everybody know what I mean by the Curia, right, in the Vatican, who were resistant to some of the things that the council was doing. Now, they weren't resistant necessarily because they were bad people. Huh? I think most, for the most part, these were good men who loved the church. But what they were was full-time bureaucrats, right? I mean, they were working in a big bureaucracy, and bureaucrats are okay. We need bureaucrats, right? Um, but the thing about a bureaucrat is you get to know how the bureaucracy works, and it's sort of like the devil you know is better than the devil you know, and they know how that works, and they felt they were the ones who were the experts about the universal church because that was their concern all the time. Right? Their concern wasn't just the church in Belfast. Their church concern was the whole church. So they felt they should be in charge of change and reform and so on. Well, of course, one of the big dynamisms of the council was that the bishops began to understand that Pope John wanted it to be a council of all the bishops, not just the curia. Right? And so all of the bishops had input and produced this wonderful vision of the church. But of course, all those bishops went home in December of 1965. Who stayed? The, the Roman Curia. So now what's res who's responsible for implementing a lot of it? Well, not only the Curia, but they played a very important role, right? And so one of the problems was I don't think the council thought through what needed to happen when they went home. They produced these wonderful documents with a great vision and I think they just sort of assumed it was just going to happen. Well, it doesn't just happen. And, and so what we got was sort of a superficial reception of the Council's teachings. Except in one, in a, I mean, in some areas, I think we've made a lot of progress. Think of the liturgy. Anybody who remembers the liturgy before Vatican II knows that we celebrate something very different now. One of the reasons for that was the Council made an exception with the liturgy. And in its document on the liturgy, it gives over 50 specific instructions for how to implement it when the council entered. You see? So the council had no choice to make the changes in the liturgy. Because, I mean, the, the church had no choice, even the curia, because the council was real clear. We've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. But in other teachings, like on the laity, we got the teaching, but they never said, and so this is what we need to do to implement the teaching. Right? So, for example, if what I said is true, that all the baptized, what the council said is true, that all the baptized must listen to God's word and we all have something to say, right? If that's true, and if the clergy, therefore, should also listen to the people, then it seems to me you should ask the question, so how are we going to do that? But we never got to that. So the council just said, all the people of God have insight, but they never explained, and so here's what you have to do. Now, the Code of Canon Law comes along in 1983, and it does offer some things. It says, for example, um, you can have pastoral councils in your parishes, but you don't have to. All right? Uh, you can have a diocesan synod, but you don't have to. You can have a plenary council with lay people involved, but you don't have to. The bishop has to at least visit or have a proxy of his visit every parish over five years, but he doesn't have to listen to the people. So do you see the problem? We didn't, we didn't get specific enough about what it would mean to be this church. 
So that's part of what we need to do now. We have to start being a lot clearer about if that's true, what are the concrete things that have to happen if that's true? And we haven't spent enough time on that. And that's why it can often sound like a lot of lofty words, but not so much maybe what we experience in our daily lives as much as it should be. Right? Now, that's just part of the answer. That's not the whole answer. But you see what a partial answer for me. It's 10 minutes right there, right? <laughs> Go on. Here and hear that. Just a, a quick sort of observation, and we talk about the, the Vatican Second Council. It, it has been very successful um, because we're now living in a, a very much more hostile world. Um, we haven't failed, haven't gone away. Uh, we are, are still here uh, as a faith. Um, and I do think that lay people are playing a much bigger role than they did before. Absolutely. You have to look around. That's right. You see it in so many forms. But I do think that we sometimes have to listen to other, for instance, the call of Our Lady, who has constantly said to, the, to the, uh, us to pray, pray, and pray again. And, um, and each person to do what they can within the world that they live in, the home they live in. And we're, we're, we all feel and I love the idea of the, the, we are all sinners, we come here as sinners. So, uh, so in, given that, are you, are you a bit happier yourself as, as we're going forward? Am I, I didn't get that very last question. Are, are, are you happy yourself that we are making progress and going forward? I think we've made progress, all right? I think we've made progress. There's no doubt we've made progress. I mean, it's hard to imagine so much of what's happening in our church today without the council. I think we have a long ways to go still. And so we have to continue to work to make the vision of the, real, the, the, vision of the council a reality. I think we've done better in some areas than we've done in others. I think we've done a lot of important work, for example, in what the council called us to in ecumenism. All right? I think we have more work to do. All right? in some parts of the world more than others, but there's, there's clearly a need to continue to work to do the kinds of things that the council called us to. Um, I am optimistic for one reason, and it's the only reason that matters, because I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I believe in the promise that God will never leave us alone, and that no matter how much we falter, no matter how much we stumble, no matter how much our leaders seem benighted, and how much we seem benighted to our leaders, the Spirit will never abandon us, and so our task is to always do the work we've been given, and to do it well, and to do it with integrity, and to let things happen according to the Lord's plan. All right? And I'm, my work is this, and, and each of us has to ask ourselves, what are we called to do to use the gifts that God has given us in the place where we find ourselves? And that's all we can do. Right? Could I ask a question about how do we know when traditions are good or evil. For example, why on earth do we use phrases like His Holiness, the Pope, His Eminence, or His Lordship? We know these are anti-Christian. Christ wouldn't have tolerated them. Why are, have we... A, a, a relative who was a missionary in South America talked about um, Paul VI wanted him to be Cardinal of Milan, like the man who died recently. And his answer was, he was the superior of the little brothers of Jesus, get out of the Vatican and save your soul. <laughs> now, this in Ireland too, uh, we have a, 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 a Republican thing, not your Republican house. Maynooth sets its sails to the prevailing wind. You know, that means that the bishops, it's certainly, uh, I'm elderly, 82 years of age, and I remember John Charles coming home and saying, there will be no change, definitely. Everything will be all right. A very good man in some ways. In some ways he was excellent, in others he wasn't. Now we're losing the youth because the youth are looking for the shabby tramp Christ. And they're not finding him in the bureaucrats. And the, the, for instance, the Catholic Universities of America. What on earth? I was working there at the time. What did they produce? for the rights of the native Indians or the blacks or that. This is what I'm saying. Many young people may feel it's time to get away from the Vatican. Uh, I don't agree with them, but I understand them. Now, we're at a crossroads in Ireland, and um, 
maybe you'd look at this for the market. There's a lot of wisdom and insight there, and I'm not sure I, I, I have a, a particularly helpful response. I think um, it is always easy for us to look at places where a lot of the decisions are made in the church, whether it's the Vatican or in our own country, and um, sometimes to be a little disappointed in what's happened. Um, and I think the church in general, all of us, I mean, we, we, if we look honestly at the history of the church, we recognize so often we do fall short in very important ways. So I, I'm not sure I got exactly the, the, the question or the point you were making. At one point, I thought you were concerned about um, church leadership that's kind of departed from what it should be about and the youth who look at our, our leadership and they say, why would we be interested in this? Is that what you were getting at? No, it's the change from what Christ seemed to teach that ah. we see okay. brilliant people with loads of degrees coming brilliant diplomats and I'm not speaking about you but you know we're looking the people the young people especially they're looking for Christ and okay. this is a worry to me because rules and regulations and all sorts of things seem to impede and sure. go to market sure okay thank you that that helped me a little bit more um I do think, you know, you're talking to the father of two 21-year-olds and an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old. And um, at the end of the day, I'm not a theologian. At the end of the day, I'm a father praying my kids are going to keep going to Mass when they leave home. And it's a 50-50 proposition, right? And uh, no, knock on wood, my children are so far. But, but I know enough to know that for many of our youth, you're right, and our young adults, they're giving up on the church. And in part, I think it's because they do not see the power of the gospel and its purity and its simplicity. And uh, that's why it seems to me that it's all the more important that the church be seen not just as the hierarchy of the clergy, though they play a role. It's got to be seen as all of us. And what are we doing to witness to the young people about what the gospel is really about? It's easy for us and for our young people to be disillusioned about um, church leadership in the Vatican that can be kind of caught up in pomp and all of that and, and politi church politics and I think that does alienate people. I was, I was sharing with Father Michael an anecdote about um, the great Cardinal John Henry Newman you know who lived in the 19th century he was an Anglican theologian who converts to Catholicism and late in his career he was given the Cardinal's hat and a journalist asked him why in his long and distinguished career he had only seen fit to go to Rome twice prior in his life. And he said, I always thought it wise to listen to the advice of my father, who said, queasy travelers ought not visit the engine room. <laughs> and I think there's some wisdom there. We need to remember the Catholic Church, our church, is not just the Vatican. It's not even primarily the Vatican. It's the whole people of God gathered in faith. And so we need to redirect the gaze away from saying the Catholic Church is about something over there, the Vatican, or it's about our bishops, or it's about the scandal of the clerical sex abuse. And we need to say instead, no, you know what the Catholic faith is about? It's about the simple person who tries to follow Jesus as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a janitor, as a teacher. We need to make sure that's what Catholicism looks like for our young people. Right? That's where the faith has got to be preserved. All right. uh, thanks very much, Ricky, uh, ah, thank for, you. for what you said. I, I was a, a young man at the time of Vatican II, and I find it uh, exceptionally hel you know, helpful and a very wonderful experience. I thought something wonderful was happening. Uh, but looking just at the history of what happened after Vatican II, uh, the one thing that was, uh, I think, uh, crucial was the whole uh, business of humani vitae and the way in which, at the end of the day, the Pope made the decision. It wasn't number 43. At least it didn't seem to me that way. Now, I don't know that we've ever managed to unpick that because we still have this sense of the infallibility of the Pope. I don't know what the answer is, I have to say, but I think that that is one key uh, point in the, the whole problem. Thank you.
Thank you for that observation. And I think it's time for me to go home. No, <laughs> no it's um, a couple of things about Humana Vitae. And for those who don't know, this is, of course, Pope Paul VI, 1968 encyclical on artificial birth regulation. A couple of things. First of all, we need to remember that this was not a question of papal infallibility, though there have been people who talked that way. The Pope quite deliberately did not solemnly define that teaching. It is what we call an authoritative but not infallible doctrine of the church. Now, I, I think that there are a lot of people who have shared your concerns, not just about the teaching. Let's leave the teaching aside a little bit. But the context in which the teaching happened. Uh, it's important to know that before Pope Paul VI, Pope John, when the council first opened, had created a commission that was going to study this question. Right? And then, of course, Pope John dies after the first session, and Pope Paul VI reconstitutes the commission, and he tells the bishops at the council, because this is the background to Humana Vitae that I think is important, he tells the bishops at the council, I don't want you to talk about birth control in detail because I'm going to create a commission. I'm, I have created or reconstituted a commission that's going to deal with it. And so by and large, the bishops didn't do that, though there are some interesting exceptions, and I, I can't help mentioning one just because I, I find it a bit humorous. There was a Melkite, an Eastern Catholic patriarch named Patriarch Maximus IV Said. He was 84 years old, and to be honest with you, I don't think he cared much whether people approved what he had to say or not. And so when they got to the question in Angadium et Spes about marriage and family and their people were sort of like hinting about birth control without actually talking about it because it was, you know, you weren't supposed to talk about it. He, he got up and he rather forthrightly said, interestingly, by the way, in French rather than Latin, because he was a Melkite priest. And of course, in the Melkite church, Latin is not their language. And so he thought the rule that everybody had to speak in Latin at the council insulting because it's not the language of the Eastern Church. So he, he gives this address in French, and he says in, in the translation in English, he says, you know, is it possible that we bishops might be talking about matters about which we are not sufficiently well informed, and that perhaps we have fallen prey, this is a direct quote, to a kind of bachelor's psychosis on these things. Now, he just sort of threw that out there, right? And of course, the bishops weren't supposed to do anything about that. So said, that's all right. The commission's going to deal with it. So, so there was this expectation that things were going to happen. And then, of course, you're right. Vatican II was talking about listening to the faithful and all of those things and the development of doctrine, that church teaching sometimes can grow and develop. And so there was an expectation in the air that this might be different. And then when the Pope expands the commission, he puts married people on the commission. And then word leaks that their report called for a modest change in the church's teaching. So there was widespread expectation of change. And I think it's that context that made Humanae Vitae so difficult for the church. Because everybody was still flush with enthusiasm about the council and change was possible and the bishops were talking honestly and they're actually consulting married people and all of those things. And then the Holy Father comes out with an encyclical in which, and this is the other thing that I think is sad, he says many positive things. <clears throat> the shame about Humanae Vitae is that people struggled with the one specific teaching about no recourse to artificial contraception, and, and we sort of, the expression, threw the baby out with the bathwater. The Pope had a lot of wonderful things to say about the gift of human sexuality and the dignity of the body and the importance of a husband and wife not just being concerned with the procreative dimension but the unitive dimension of their marital sexuality. He said lots of wonderful things. The people had a problem with some reason with a particular prohibition and so we, blew, we, we ignored everything. And, and whether this was good or bad, I don't think there's any doubt. That was a watershed moment for the church, at least in the Western world. And, and, and the thing that I find sad about it is that people's difficulties with Humanae Vitae sort of created a chain reaction where they began to wonder when and where they really should be paying attention to what the bishops teach. And I think that's sad because I think more often than not our bishops, our official church teaching is filled with wisdom and insight to guide us today. But Humana Vitae created this difficult situation where they weren't, it didn't seem like the Pope was listening to the wisdom and insight of the people there. So what are we to do with all the other teachings then that happened? And that's, and that's where I think the church is in a tough place right now, right? 
we need to recover the recover the credibility uh, of our church because I'll be honest with you I think we need prophetic teachers to call us to gospel living and so we should not be enthused about the fact that the credibility of the Pope or the bishops may be called into attention because of humana vitae or because of other things we need to work hard to try all of us to restore the credibility of the church so I don't want to diminish that I think you're right there's no way to, to, to kind of whitewash that. We're in a different place since Humanae Vitae, and I think we have to try and work a little harder to become the kind of church that the council called us to. Popes, bishops, and ordinary people. All of us need to continue to do more work to implement this teaching. Uh, people are called to implement a lot of the documents or the teachings of Vatican II, but what authority have lay people? You mentioned there what authority uh, about, sorry? I didn't understand. What authority have lay people? You mentioned some of the recommendations that came out in 1983, and very few of them may have happened. So what authority or power Good. have lay people to force Good. that? Or what line of communication is there? Thank you. I'm going to make a distinction between authority and power. <laughs> I don't know that we have a lot of power, but we do have authority. The authority is the authority of our baptism. The authority is the authority that comes from Christians who are learning to... Um, hear the gospel and apply it to our daily, daily lives. That's the authority. The authority is the authority of our baptism. Now, has the church given real power to us to articulate that and to play a part in the decision making of the church? Not as much as it needs to, in my view. I don't deny in any way the teaching authority of the bishops, but in my view, there are three kinds of authority that complement each other in the church. And when all three are acknowledged, the church is going to be at its healthiest. Does that follow? So first, there's the authority of baptism. And it's the authority of the people here. You're here because you're committed Christians. You're here because you want to live the gospel and apply it in your lives. And there's an authority that comes with that. There's a wisdom that you have. I think of the wisdom of my grandmother. It wasn't the wisdom of being ordained. It wasn't the wisdom of being a theologian. It was a wisdom of being a faithful Catholic for almost a hundred years. And, and I would have been foolish not to listen to her insight. Does that follow? That's, there's an authority that comes from the fact that it's you and I that put our faith into practice daily. And we learn from that. Right? And frankly, our church works best when our bishops listen to our modest insights. And it doesn't work as well when the bishops don't listen. All right, so we have an authority by our baptism. Second, there's an authority of scholarship. There's the authority of scholars who dedicated their lives to studying scripture, to studying church history, to trying to use the tools of philosophy and theology to continue to ask important questions about what does it mean to follow Jesus here and now? And I think our church is enriched when we listen to the authority of theologians who say, look, this is what this text means. This is what was going on at the Council of Trent. This is what the sacrament of the Eucharist is about. And when our bishops listen to theologians, even those of differing viewpoints, and when the people of God take advantage of the riches of scholarship, I think we all grow in the faith. And then there's the authority that comes through holy orders. There's the authority of the apostolic teaching office. This is the authority of the bishops who alone are the, uh, are the normative teachers of the faith. They're the ones that sort of set the boundaries for the way we talk about our faith. They're the ones who in a way act like the umpires or referees to say, play the game in all of its creativity. But at some point we have to remind you what the rules of the game are, right? And, and the church suffers when theologians don't listen to the bishops and the people don't listen to the bishops. Our church flourishes when all three of those authorities listen to one another. When the bishops listen to the people and theologians, when theologians learn from the simple but profound witness of the people, and when theologians listen to the normative teaching of the bishops, all of them have to do that. 
Our problem is in our church, it hasn't worked that well. We have tended in the modern church to put all of our emphasis on the authority of the bishops, and I, I hope you've heard me say it's real, but not so much on the authority of the people. The assumption was the only obligation of the people. You saw Pius X said it. What's the <laughs> obligation of the people? It's not about authority, it's about obedience, period. Now, we'll survive as a church that way. I don't think we'll flourish. We'll only flourish when all of us, theologians too, have the humility to say, I don't have the whole answer. I don't have the whole story. One of the great gifts of Vatican II, one of the great gifts of Vatican II, is it called us all to humility. It taught in Dave Verbum Article 8. You know, a lot of us, if you're Catholics of a certain age, you're accustomed to learning, and sometimes you may still hear it today, that the Catholic Church has the truth. Now, Protestants don't have the truth. They may have a bit of it because they read the Bible, but only the Catholics have the whole truth. Vatican II doesn't talk about the church having the truth. Vatican II talks about the church moving toward the fullness of truth. That's in Dei Verbum 8. Vatican II says the church is a pilgrim. Now I want you to think about what a pilgrim is. A pilgrim doesn't wander around aimlessly. The pilgrim's on a journey. They know where they're going. That's the truth. They know where they're going, but they also know they haven't arrived yet. Huh? To be a pilgrim is to recognize you haven't figured it all out. You're still on the journey. Vatican II said the church is pilgrim. It's on a journey. It's living into God's truth. That means we don't have an answer to everything yet. And we'll continue to be pilgrims when bishops, theologians, and ordinary lay people all have the humility, each of us, to say, I don't have all of it myself. I need everybody's contributions for the church to be the kind of faithful pilgrim people that Vatican II called us to. Thank you all so much for coming this evening.